Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife the Lord God made tunics of skin, and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever? And therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden, to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way, to guard the way to the tree of life. Genesis chapter 3 up until this point, we've experienced what life was intended to be, how things were supposed to be originally. Adam and Eve lived innocent lives as a married couple in paradise, a perfect, blissful, and peaceful existence where we could commune with God face to face any time was meant to be ours. But Genesis 3 is where it all falls apart. Genesis 3 is where we're introduced to disappointment. Yet that's not all. Let's again pray that God opens our hearts and minds to help us not insert our own opinions or biases as we read, but rather, let's ask for his understanding and wisdom as we dig deeper into his word. Before we get into the text, we have to come to terms with that there is something larger at stake here. There is a great controversy, a battle between good and evil, a war between God and Satan. Yet there still seems to be some kind of rules of engagement that have been implemented and are being followed. Within this chapter, we'll see that God allows Satan to tempt Adam and Eve. However, he is bound or restricted to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
God is even allowed to warn his children about the dangers. We'll dissect this further as we read along. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Immediately in the first verse of chapter 3, we are introduced to a new crafty character, the serpent. Yet to understand everything going forward, we need to try to understand who the serpent is. The text seems to be referencing a particular serpent, one that the original audience would have possibly recognized. You would think that it would be simple, that it's just a plain, slithering snake. But there are several interpretations that could or have been applied to this section of scripture. 1. The snake is independent of Satan. Some scholars have tried to argue that the serpent is separate from Satan, that the Bible is copying from other tales where there is a deceptive snake, such as in the Epic of Gilgamesh. However, later in the Bible, Satan is referenced as that serpent of old, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. So, at the very least, the serpent is associated with Satan in some manner. Whether it is actually Satan or not doesn't really matter. The serpent is no ordinary serpent. 2. The serpent was possessed without consent. Whether metaphorical or literal, I'm not sure that this makes any sense. It wouldn't be fair if God had cursed the serpent knowing that it had no choice in the matter. This loving, thoughtful God that we've read about in these first two chapters wouldn't punish an innocent animal. There must be more to it. 3. Satan shapeshifts into a serpent. Again, this wouldn't be fair to the serpent if taken literally. Why would God curse the serpent when it had no say over what Satan transformed into or not? It wouldn't be fair if God cursed a rabbit or a lion if Satan had chosen to morph into one of those creatures either. Therefore, it wouldn't be just for the serpent to be punished later for something out of its control. And let's be honest we would be giving way too much credit to the evil one if we suggested that he transformed into something that God had not created. Satan has only been shown to imagine and create chaos, destruction, and death. 4. The serpent cooperated with Satan. It's hard to say whether Eve is surprised by the serpent being able to start a conversation. If she is surprised, then it's no wonder she eats the forbidden fruit. In the moment, she would have fully believed that the delicacy would open her mind to a higher plane of existence, like it did for the serpent. Yet, if Eve isn't surprised, then it opens up the possibility of animals pre-fall being able to talk in some manner, or Adam and Eve having an ability to communicate with wildlife to some degree. Perhaps animals had more freedom of choice than is to be believed. If God gives us free will to choose him or not, why wouldn't he give that same choice to all living creatures on earth? Perhaps this soon-to-be snake heeded the lies of the devil. There is a possibility that Adam and Eve both knew of Satan's rebellion and would have been on guard for an angel of light. Therefore, Satan seduced the serpent first, then used the serpent as a medium to lure and deceive Eve. It would then make sense for the serpent to be cursed later on along with Satan. 5. The serpent isn't a serpent at all. When translating the word serpent, some Hebrew translators have interpreted it as meaning the shining one. A similar translation happens later in the book of Numbers, when God instructs Moses to make a fiery bronze serpent and to set it on a pole for the Israelites to look at if they're ever bitten by a desert serpent. You can find this in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. In the case of the bronze serpent, it has positive attributes or connotations. So, if Satan is credited as the original deceiver in Revelation, it's possible that the serpent in Genesis isn't actually a serpent at all, but rather Satan, another created creature, in whatever glory that he had that was given by God. Perhaps at the time of the writing of Genesis, there wasn't a word for the devil, 
So Moses used what would have been the closest metaphorical description of the enemy, an evil, slippery, clever, deceptive serpent. Again, we don't know exactly how much Adam and Eve knew. Perhaps Eve was surprised and curious that an angel of light was near the forbidden tree and went to investigate with disastrous results because she didn't know what Satan looked like. It's plausible Satan changed his facial structure to hide his true identity. Again, this would make sense as to why the serpent is cursed later on. Whether you believe that the serpent is in fact a serpent, or is Satan himself, the next words out of its mouth to Eve seeks to question the accuracy of God's word. The serpent quotes God, yet every syllable that the serpent speaks seeks to destroy Eve's vision of God and his character. For example, the serpent uses the term Elohim to try to make God seem more distant or disconnected from Eve. He tries to create an element of doubt when planting his misleading seed within the first lie ever told. Chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. It may not seem like it, but Eve says a lot within these two verses as she engages with the serpent. We don't know why she's near the forbidden tree to begin with. We haven't been told how long it's been since the creation of Adam and Eve. No tale of the blissful existence in between chapters 2 and 3 is ever mentioned. There's just a sudden shift in tone, and with it, the setup for a great fall. Perhaps Eve was wanting to clarify what Yahweh had said, yet within her words, it seems she has a vague understanding of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and of God's command. When quoting what her maker originally said, she doesn't quite say it correctly. She both adds to it and misquotes it. God never said to not touch the fruit of that tree, although I'm sure he wished they wouldn't touch it or go near it at all. God also said, you shall surely die, while Eve states, lest you die. In her words, she seems to be declaring that death might follow. Adam and Eve seem to know what death is, yet Eve implies that she doesn't believe that such a thing could ever happen. She doesn't seem to consider it to be a guarantee. Similarly, when referencing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she uses the general term tree in the midst of the garden. She knew what the name of the tree was. Yet in her response, she seems to be placing the forbidden tree in the same category or class as the other trees that she could eat from. Within her answer to the serpent, she suggests that she doesn't take the word of God seriously. And even if she did, her words could also imply that she didn't eat from the prohibited tree out of love, but rather she did it out of fear. This could explain why she accepted the term Elohim that the serpent used instead of the more personal term, Yahweh Elohim. All in all, her reply could also implicate Adam. Remember how when God stated to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis 2, Verses 16 and 17. Eve wasn't there. I imagine that God would have warned her specifically, explaining everything in depth, as he did Adam. Yet as the first created human being and her husband, Adam had a responsibility to guide Eve in some way. Possibly from her words, she might not have been instructed by Adam in the best way. Chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The serpent has hooked Eve with his carefully and perfectly constructed lie that is still told even today. It's safe to assume that the devil had watched and planned exactly how to tempt Eve for some time. He knew exactly how to phrase his conversation with her to exploit her weaknesses. He claims that Eve must have misunderstood what God had originally commanded. 
and within these venomous words, it contradicts and revises the word of God, explaining it in his own way, placing his authority above the Heavenly Father and projecting his own blasphemous desires of being like God onto Eve. The serpent makes the fruit of the forbidden tree seem more and more attractive with each syllable. He lies by saying that Eve could gain immortality. And Eve hangs on to every word, confused as to what was the word of her creator versus the word of the tempter. Look at the serpent. If eating the fruit caused this serpent to be so mesmerizing, then what more could it do for her? She begins to believe more and more that God must be holding back something truly good from both her and her husband. The future snake implies that Eve isn't perfectly made by God that she needs this fruit to become something more, and that God is afraid of what she would become. Satan implies that God must be trying to control them. She could be complete or fulfilled if she just ate of this tantalizing fruit. And so, step by step, Eve inches closer to eating the fruit, closer to denying God and trusting in her own feelings and desires, rather than trusting in her Maker. Chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Quickly, I want to mention that we have no idea what this fruit looked like. It may have resembled an apple. It might not have. Either way, Eve is in awe of the food before her eyes. The hanging delicacy looked appetizing. And in a moment, she spirals downward. Despite any instruction that she had been given in the past, she lusts after it anyway, believing that it will gratify her in some way. She wanted to be like God and places herself in his position, judging the forbidden fruit as good. She covets the wisdom and glory that the serpent promised her. Within seconds, she begins to counteract and dismantle God's word in her mind. She believes in the serpent's so-called authority and takes the fruit from the tree that had been placed off limits. She had to have a taste, and she takes a bite. However, she had already sinned before she ate of the fruit. Her thoughts and curiosity had betrayed her. And then, she betrays her husband. Within the text, Eve gives the fruit to Adam. The verse uses the term, with her, to describe his presence. However, there are a couple of ways that this could be interpreted. 1. Eve wanted Adam to eat with her. It's possible that Eve wandered off by herself, was alone, and Adam was somewhere close by. If Adam had been with her, he might have been able to deter her away from the sinful act. Unfortunately, he isn't there. And in the moment, she truly believes that she has attained a higher state of mind and is eager to share this discovery with her husband. She finds him, trying to persuade him to take just a bite. Look, she's fine. There's debating between the pair and contemplating on Adam's part. After some protesting, Adam takes the fruit from her hand and he eats. Suddenly, guilt and shame wash over them together in that moment. They've been exposed. 2. Adam is standing right there with Eve. It's also plausible that Adam was passively standing by, watching all of this unfold. He's not off in the distance and far away. He's right there. And instead of being her protector and guide, Adam doesn't do anything. He's silent. Perhaps he is just as intrigued by the serpent. But the deciding factor is the words of his wife. Instead of taking the lead, Adam follows after his companion, placing her above God. He chooses the creation over the Creator, the same way that Eve did. Either way, both Adam and Eve eat of this forbidden fruit. But why does Adam take of the fruit and eat? 
Again, there are a few ways that it can be perceived. 1. Adam eats out of ignorance. Some argue that Adam may not have even known that the fruit was from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that Eve withheld that information from her husband, and he was completely unaware that he was sinning. However, as the one who was personally instructed by God to not eat of the forbidden fruit, and as the one who was charged with being the gardener of Eden, it seems unlikely that he wouldn't know what the prohibited fruit looked like. Not only that, but if he truly ate the fruit on accident, not knowing what he was eating, I don't think God would have judged him like he did later on. Adam clearly knew what he was doing. 2. Adam eats as an act of tolerance. Perhaps Adam, like his wife, didn't think that it truly mattered either. It's possible that he also didn't take God's word seriously and believe that it wasn't a big deal at all. It's even plausible that in a way, he felt peer pressured. He may not have wanted his wife to feel bad or guilty, so he partakes to make her feel better. Perhaps he compromised his beliefs in an attempt to be tolerant of Eve's transgression. 3. Adam eats as an act of sacrifice. Later in the Bible, in Romans 5, Adam is referenced as a type of him who was to come, or Jesus to be exact. Therefore, some speculate that Adam sacrifices himself for his bride, knowing the consequences. Similarly, Christ would eventually shed his blood and die for his bride, or his people. However, Christ would be the perfect example or sacrifice where Adam failed. Through the first Adam's sacrifice, sin was introduced into the world, but through the second Adam, through Jesus' sacrifice, sin lost its power. Based on the text, it seems like Adam was completely and utterly aware of what he was doing when he ate of the forbidden fruit. He knew exactly what it was just as his wife did. He knew the consequences, the cost, the weight behind it, and yet he does it anyway. Perhaps he even lies to himself, thinking that it must be fine considering Eve is standing in front of him, still as alive and innocent as before. He doesn't want to be without his bride. He thinks that he would be left all alone. And in the moment, Adam seems to place Eve and her word in the position of God, or even above God. His love for her trumps his love for his heavenly father. Within failing this seemingly small, easily avoidable test, they both proved that there was a deeper issue of mistrust toward God. And once they had both committed the sin, they realized their mistake. It turns out that they were better off not knowing this newly gained knowledge of sin. Suddenly, through the serpent's craftiness, they are ashamed of their nakedness, unlike before at the end of chapter 2. Their innocence has disappeared. They're self-conscious. Yet on a deeper level, they are spiritually naked. Their connection to God is severed. Eating the fruit was not as pleasant as they thought it would be. Unlike other ancient Near East stories, when the Edenic couple eat of the fruit, there are negative repercussions. They actually lose their immortality instead of gaining it. They actually become less like God. And thus they frantically try to take it upon themselves to cover their nude bodies with nearby, itchy, uncomfortable fig leaves in the garden. Yet they couldn't cover themselves with their own works or righteousness. In this moment, they are related to the serpent and identified with him. And although they didn't die physically right away, for the first time in their lives, they're afraid. Not because God is angry, but because they are guilty. Chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? 
whether in the evening or the morning, or at the time of the coming cooling of the Spirit of the Lord, the text seems to convey that Adam drags his wife along to hide among the vegetation in the garden when they heard a familiar sound that used to regularly bring them both joy and delight. Now that same sound only caused anxiety and fear. They both lacked the courage to stand before God or run to him. They thought that he was distant and that he might want to strike them down for their disobedience. So they hid in between the tree trunks, bushes, and other greenery while God desperately sought them out, like a parent searches for their child. Now God knew exactly where they were and what they did, yet he seems to respect their free will, and he gives them a chance to come out and repent. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Adam reveals himself to God, perhaps realizing that it's pointless to try to hide from the one who had planted the vegetation around them. Yet Adam also comes out ready to defend himself and his own actions. But God hears him out. God is a just, patient judge, open and transparent, giving proper care to listen to both parties and investigate all evidence, even giving the opportunity to repent. Chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. What's ironic is that Adam and Eve were as close to being like God as they could have been, considering that they had been made in his image. Yet, look at them now. Within such a short amount of time, the once perfect couple have completely changed. Their personalities seem to be totally different. Before, Adam held his wife in such high regard. When God presented Eve to Adam, he was in awe. He cherished and loved her so dearly that he even knowingly violated God's command. Yet, now, Adam hides behind her and throws his bride under the bus like she's nothing. He casts the blame onto her for his own lack of judgment. He goes even further and assigns blame to God for his own nakedness and for giving the woman to him. Adam claims that he would never have made that mistake if it weren't for God and his created daughter. Adam tries his best to avoid taking responsibility for his actions and choices. Eve doesn't do much better. She follows her husband's example and tries to shift the blame onto the serpent who deceived her. Again, Adam knew what he was doing while Eve was deceived. Perhaps they actually believed that God would approve of their disobedience in some fashion. Neither of them ever denied that they ate of the fruit, and it shows. Adam and Eve seem to be more afraid of or detest the results of sin more than the sin itself. Sin has permeated their entire being, and it's breaking God's heart. Their relationship in this moment was shattered. Chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God turns to the future snake and curses it. They already had history with one another. In addressing the serpent first, God knows who instigated all of this. He knew that Satan had spoken to Adam and Eve as only God should speak. Our Heavenly Father knows that this deception will echo throughout the rest of human history. He is aware of the death, depravity, and destruction that will naturally occur because of sin. And he's angry. From a literal standpoint, God declares that the serpent will now have to crawl in the dust. Scripture never tells us what the serpent looked like exactly. We don't know whether it had wings and could fly, or if it had two legs to walk, or if it wasn't a serpent at all, but rather Satan. Either way, the serpent is now cursed to slither along the ground. However, metaphorically speaking, God also curses Satan. After his rebellion in heaven, Satan was lower than even humans. 
considering that he was classified symbolically as a beast of the field. Perhaps Satan thought that by tempting our first parents, he would gain a higher status of some kind. However, Satan, who was once of the highest order of angels in heaven, is now declared to be the lowest creature on earth. He went from more cunning than any beast to cursed more than all. Lucifer's craftiness led to his own curse and downfall. From this point on, throughout Scripture and the entirety of history, God and Satan would each have their own followers. People will choose whom they will serve. But God also states that the evil one will be defeated. In the moment, Adam and Eve may not have known what God was saying, but a redemption plan was being pronounced. Jesus cares for and loves his children enough to come to earth in human form to defeat the devil through the death of the cross and reinstate the status of life for his people. However, he would not be unscathed. The Savior would show the scars of his sacrifice. But one day, God promised that Satan would be vanquished and that sin would cease to exist. Within the center of the chapter, whenever there is complete hopelessness, the first prophecy of hope is declared. Chapter 3, verse 16. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. One thing to note is that God curses the serpent and the ground, but he doesn't curse Adam or Eve. He judges them. They made their choice, and now there would be natural consequences from sin. Unfortunately, because of her choice, Eve would now feel pain in pregnancy. What was meant to be a blessing would now bring agony. Her children might decide to follow the deceiver as she did. She would have to possibly witness the death of her children. However, she also had the hope that one of her children would redeem them in the future. Also, her relationship with Adam would be altered. Marriage was originally meant to be a partnership, where the man and woman would be parallel with each other. Now, both man and woman are self-seeking, taking every opportunity to have authority over the other. Women would now have a strong negative desire to overpower their male spouse. At the same time, men might try to dominate, intimidate, or take advantage of their female counterparts. Yet, if they chose, they could positively love, submit to, and serve one another, supporting each other in their new toilsome lives. Either way, these results would echo throughout the ages. Chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it, all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. God's judgment was very specific. He repeats what he had first said to Adam in chapter 2 reminding him of his responsibility in all of this, considering that he was the first one that God had instructed in this matter. Adam had chosen his wife over God. Eve had thought that her and her husband would achieve something more, that they would be perfect and godlike by eating the forbidden fruit. It was important for Adam to learn that independence from God didn't equal a higher or more exalted existence. Without God, there is no life. By transferring rulership of earth over to Satan, there would only be sorrow and affliction. Thorns and thistles, or rather symbolically, sin and wickedness, would permeate everything and everyone. The blue planet was in disorder and chaos now. Both their bodies and nature would degrade over time, eventually returning to the dust where they had come from. Rather than looking up to God, their natural tendency would be to look down. Because appetite played a part in the first sin ever committed, 
food would now need work to cultivate and grow. Long hours, sweat, and exertion would accompany the desire to sustain themselves. But God actually does Adam a favor by cursing the ground. Curses were never used to ruthlessly punish, but rather to restore broken relationships. Mankind is far less likely to sin when their minds are occupied with work. Idle hands are the devil's workshop, as the saying goes. Toil and hard labor would develop character for generations. From their weekly labors, humankind would learn both humility and cooperation with God. They would need to depend on their Maker even more. Again, God continues to show mercy to our first parents. By not exacting judgment on Adam and Eve in that moment, God grants them and the rest of humanity the chance to choose Him, to choose life, in our mortal lives. God is not willing to give up on us. His heart aches for us and the rest of His creation. Jesus would later take on a crown of thorns, taking on sin both metaphorically and physically so that we could get back to what it was originally meant to be at the beginning. We are not alone in this fight. God is with us. Chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. After all of the declarations and judgments, Adam seems to return somewhat to his normal self. He chooses to trust God and his promise. For the first time, the woman is referenced as Eve, Eve meaning life or living. And in this naming, Adam isn't displaying dominance over Eve, but rather he's appreciative that she would bring life where he had brought death. He expresses that he has faith that there's hope for the future with the coming Savior. He believed that at some point, a Messiah would come through the woman's seed and would put an end to sin. However, they would be reminded of the sacrifice that would eventually be made for them and the rest of mankind. For the first time, an animal had to die in order for Adam and Eve, the first priests, to receive warmer, more durable clothing to cover themselves. A spotless lamb would forever be a reminder and type of the future sacrifice that Jesus would make. This was the new reality that they both lived in, and God was guiding them through it all. Chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The burden of sin was heavy. Adam and Eve used to be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil, but not anymore. Adam and Eve had to leave the only home that they had ever known. They had to leave paradise, cast out into the outer courtyard. But it was for their own good. Again, it seems like God put within the fruit of the tree of life an ability to grant immortality. So, as an act of mercy, the Trinity agree that our first parents must be sent away. They had to leave the garden, otherwise they might eat of the tree of life and live forever in sin. God couldn't let that happen. So Adam has to go back to where he was originally created, outside of the Garden of Eden. They walk away as the entrance into the Garden of Eden is closed and closely guarded by cherubim behind them. Then both Adam and his wife, in sadness and shame, seek to make a life out in the unknown, camping out in the now sinful wilds. And that's where chapter 3 ends. Verse after verse, everything spirals down out of control until it's assumed that all is lost. Hiding from God, 
making excuses, covering ourselves with our own righteousness, doesn't work. Life now has an end point. The more personal term, Yahweh Elohim, slowly faded out of usage throughout chapter 3 and won't reappear until the story of Abraham. The relationship between God and humanity has been damaged, but there is a glimmer of hope in the distance. The Israelites are reminded of this as they camp in tents around the tabernacle in the desert, as they are outside of the sanctuary, and as they participate in the sacrificial ceremonies. They too long to be back in Eden, back in the presence of God. At the fall, humanity hid their faces from God. Out of mercy, God hid his face throughout the ages. Otherwise, humanity would have been obliterated from his brightness and glory. And in the end, God will make all things new, allowing us to stand face to face with our Creator once again. A lot was covered in this study. I tried my best to explore all possibilities and aspects. Again, this study is not perfect. There might be things that I'm missing or concepts that I'm either misinterpreting or misunderstanding. But I pray that God will reveal more of his wisdom to me as I continue to read through his word. But of course, don't take my word for it. Continue to study and seek. <laughs>